here. So welcome everybody to our last uh, 1L mini lecture of our spring and summer season um, on introduction to paying the price for carbon pollution with Professor Sharon Masher. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda. The City of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and I would also like to acknowledge that we're very lucky to be at the University of Calgary, which is situated on land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Elbow River, and that the traditional Blackfoot name of this place is Mokinsis, which we now call Calgary. So a brief introduction of Professor Masher for you. Sharon's research focuses on legal issues relating to climate change law, environmental law, property law, and laws affecting Indigenous peoples. Her recent publications include a co-authored article on the international experience with carbon pricing and an article on the Canadian carbon pricing experience. Sharon's current research is focused on liability for climate change damage and carbon disclosure. Um, a little plug, you should follow Sharon on Twitter. And also, if you're not already looking on a blog, which is the University of Calgary Faculty of Law's blog and award-winning blog on many different subjects, you'll find Sharon and many other of our professors there on um, legal issues that are in the moment, uh, up and coming things or things that are happening right now. Um, just finally, uh, the courses that Sharon's been teaching are property, so some of you will be lucky enough to have Sharon for property, environmental law and ethics, and climate change. So thank you, Sharon, for being with us today. I'll allow you to take it away and we'll get to questions um, at the end of your lecture. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And hi, everyone. Um, as Catherine just said, I teach property law in the first year, so I'm really looking forward to getting to know many of you um, over this coming year. So I'm just going to try and share my screen here. Is that looking okay? Yeah, good. Okay. All right, so today, um, probably having bitten off more than really um, is feasible in 30 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about or introduce you to the Pan-Canadian approach to carbon pricing and just touch at the end on the constitutional challenge, hoping to wet your teeth for constitutional law and division of powers, which I'm sure you're already very excited about. So um, as probably many, if not most of you know, in the next couple months, the Supreme Court of Canada is scheduled to hear a reference from the governments of Alberta, or so not Alberta, Saskatchewan and Ontario as to the constitutional validity of a piece of federal legislation called the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act. And I'll just call that the GGPPA. So in the next 30 minutes, what I'm hoping to do is again, introduce you to this pan-Canadian approach to carbon pricing and explain the role that um, this backstop legislation, the GGBPA plays so that you can understand what's at stake here, what the federal government has attempted to do with its carbon pricing um, approach and what the provincial governments are objecting to. I just wanna start Oh, and Ali, how do I do? See my... So if you go down to the bottom. Okay, I think I have to stop sharing to see it. Yeah. Okay, and I'm just going to ask you um, a few questions um, to see where you're at in relation to your thinking on carbon pricing. So if you could just take a minute here um, to jump in on this poll and tell me um, whether you think carbon pricing, federal carbon pricing is a good thing, a bad thing, or you don't really have an opinion either way. And for anyone living outside of BC, Quebec or Nova Scotia, what you think the current um, price is on carbon. And is there a third question there, Ellie? Yes. Yes. And if you live in BC, what you think the price that you're paying uh, at the pump, your gasoline carbon price is um, right now. So 
so far, most people think the carbon price is a good thing. Mm, a lot of ambivalence as well. <laughs> um, outside of BC, Quebec, and Nova Scotia, most people don't know what the uh, carbon price is. Interesting. The same goes for in BC. <laughs> So, okay, that's a super interesting information there, everybody, um, because I'll just get back to sharing the screen here. First of all, how you feel about the carbon price um, may be informed by where you're located. So um, studies across Canada show that people in Alberta are more, more likely to be um, disinclined towards the federal carbon price than in most other jurisdictions in Canada. So there is that place where we're situated and the information we receive that informs our understanding of the carbon price. But secondly, what's really interesting is that um, the carbon price is meant to be a behavior change tool. So the revenue by and large in, that's collected in um, British Columbia is mostly recycled back to its citizens. And under the federal backstop legislation that's applying in lots of jurisdictions, the money is returned to us in Alberta now, the money is returned to us um, at the end of the year through our income tax. And the idea is that we will be motivated to change our behavior because rather than paying the carbon price, we'll use less um, gasoline or, or heat our homes less or whatever um, in order to receive the benefit of the money that we are return, uh, that's returned to us and therefore to change our behavior. But it's very interesting that most people don't really know what the carbon price is. Even people who have a really strong opinion against the carbon price often don't know what it is. So currently um, in Alberta, the carbon price is four and a half cents, 0 0.0442. That's the federal backstop $20 a ton carbon price applying at the pump. In BC, the carbon price though is $40 a ton. So currently it is uh, six, six and a half cents, I think. I think I got that right. Oh no, it's 8.84 um, cents a ton at the pump in BC. But as you know, the variation in our carbon, in our gasoline prices between jurisdiction is way more that, than that difference in the carbon price. So there's a lot going into what we pay um, for gasoline or other fossil fuels that may at the current prices be more likely to affect our behavior um, than the carbon price we currently have. So that's why many say this price must go higher if it is really to change behavior and therefore we're at the beginning of this conversation. Okay. Just to situate us, in 2015, of course, Canada, along with uh, 195 other countries, signed the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement adopts a bottom-up approach that says to countries, tell us through your national, de nationally determined contributions what you're prepared to do to reduce your emissions, set your target, and every five years we expect a ratcheting up in ambition of those targets. So Canada's nationally determined contribution for 2030 is to reduce our emissions to 30% below uh, our 2005 levels. So as you can see from this uh, chart here, this figure, this isn't the first target Canada has set um, and it's not and, and our, in past history shows that we really haven't been very successful at meeting our targets, not our Kyoto target, not our Copenhagen target. And we have a long way to go to meet our Paris target or to get to carbon neutrality in 2050, as is our newest um, commitment. So 
When the federal government came home from Paris, what they did was convene a meeting of territories, uh, provincial um, governments, and the federal government to make a plan for how it was we were going to meet this Paris target. And following a working group, group report, what was agreed on was a pan-Canadian approach to pricing carbon. This recognizes that carbon pricing plays a central role, one of four um, key planks in this framework in meeting our targets. As you can see on the side here, this was formalized through the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change. And if you look to the side there, you can see that almost everyone agreed. The outlier from the outset was Saskatchewan, who was never, never signed on to the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth. Okay, but as I say, along with three other pillars, carbon pricing plays a central role. Okay, so what's the plan? An important piece of the Pan-Canadian framework is that it gave a significant nod to the federal structure of our, uh, of Canada, and recognized that several provinces were already implementing their own carbon pricing systems. Alberta, first in North America to do so, then BC, Quebec, and at the time Ontario had also committed to a carbon pricing system. So this plan decided to adopt a flexible approach. So rather than impose a single carbon price, the federal plan, the Pan-Canadian framework, adopts a flexible approach. So it does this by establishing what's referred to as a carbon pricing benchmark. So the benchmark provides everybody has to have a carbon price in place by 2018. At a minimum to ensure that the carbon pricing mechanisms cover the same kind of sources, at a minimum they have to apply to the same sources, those carbon pricing systems as British Columbia's carbon tax. But then there's a choice. This is the flexibility. There's a choice. Jurisdictions can choose to take a system like BC's, the carbon tax, to adopt a hybrid system like Alberta had in place at the time that I'm going to uh, explain to you, or to adopt a cap and trade system that Quebec had, has, that Ontario had committed to, but has since um, backed out of, and that Nova Scotia has now taken on. So that's the flexibility piece. But to ensure price stringency, the benchmark also sets the minimum price required. And in explicit price-based systems like BC and Alberta, the price was to start at $10 a ton at a minimum in 2018 and rise by $10 a ton uh, to $50 a ton in 2022. Additional requirements were imposed on those cap and trade jurisdictions. Okay, so this flexibility is a key piece of the Pan-Canadian pricing benchmark. And it's unusual in federal systems where there's a carbon price, generally the federal government or the Commonwealth and government imposes a single price. In Canada, the approach was to say, again, four of you provinces are already working on this. You've designed systems that suit your own particular circumstances. So let's take a flexible approach, you choose. But to make it fair and to ensure that the price is going to meet the objectives um, set out by the plan, we'll have these minimum stringency requirements. And then the obvious question is, what happens if you don't meet them? And that's where the federal backstop comes in. Okay, so let's just look really briefly then at how the benchmark works and particularly at BC and Alberta's carbon 
pricing system. The reason it's useful to look at these two um, jurisdictions is uh, because, as I understand it, um, most of you are from either Alberta or British Columbia, but also Alberta and BC were both very much leaders in North America on uh, carbon pricing. And also, as those systems existed at the time that the Pan-Canadian uh, benchmark was agreed to, they were each recognized as methods of meeting the system, but they demonstrate the flexibility. So obviously, very different emissions profiles, Alberta's emissions growing substantially, due in large part to the oil sands. BC having a fall between 2005 and 2016 attributed to their carbon price. All right, so if you're going to design a carbon pricing mechanism for BC or Alberta, it's important to stop and look at what the emissions profiles of each jurisdiction is. You can see in Alberta, far and away, the largest source of emissions is oil and gas. And a significant proportion of that is oil sands. Electricity is also pretty big in Alberta because we, are, um, we have a big coal-fired power fleet. It's being phased out, outside of the carbon price. But in BC, that's not an issue at all because of the resource, um, the hydro resource that's being used. Transportation is where BC's biggest emission sources come from. Much fewer um, emissions in BC from, from heavy industry. Um, in fact, the second highest source of emissions is buildings. And so that was something in BC's mind when they designed their carbon pricing system. And again, in Alberta, oil sands emissions loom large. Okay. So what does BC's system look like? Well, for those of you in BC, um, you may know, although you may not know, given that you had no idea what the carbon price was, the carbon tax took effect in 2008. And what it does is impose a direct price on each ton of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, that, is, and that results from the combustion of fossil fuels. Okay. The price is currently set at $40 a ton, and there's a, shed, a, a regulation that specifies for each different kind of fossil fuel how much CO2 is released per gigawatt hour or per liter, etc., and the price is attached proportionately. There's also the potential for an emissions intensity limit um, in relation to LNG operations, none yet are in operation, and so. Um, that isn't yet in place. So the BC carbon price just applies a direct price on the combustion of fossil fuels purchased and used within the province. Compliance involves paying the price. Okay, the way to avoid paying the price is change your behavior and uh, use less fossil fuels um, for the purposes of combustion. The BC carbon pricing system doesn't apply to non-combustion emissions. And a big important hole there is fugitive and process emissions from natural gas productions. Okay, so there must be the combustion of a fossil fuel in order for the price to apply. Compliance is you pay the price. Covers 70% of BC's total GHG emissions because transportation and buildings are their large sources of emissions. Alberta, at least prior to 2019, took a different approach. First of all, under the Notley government, a carbon levy was imposed. This carbon levy looks very similar to the BC carbon tax. Direct price on each ton of CO2 equivalent resulting from the combustion of fossil fuels. And I should say in all of these, there's lots of exemptions, agricultural uses, for example. But there's a second piece in the Alberta system. And this is picking up the 
previous system that's been in place since 2007. For large emitters, and particularly emitters with over 100,000 uh, tons of, of carbon emissions a year, or CO2 equivalent emissions a year, we have a special system in Alberta. At the time, prior to 2019, it was under the Carbon Competitiveness Incentives Regulation. And what this does for those facilities that are covered by this legislation, it attaches an intensity-based uh, reduction benchmark on every product produced. So for every barrel of oil, there's an emissions intensity benchmark. You should be able to produce that barrel of oil without producing X number of emissions as set by the benchmark. If you go over it, those emissions are exposed to the carbon price. If you stay under it, you pay nothing. Okay, so emitter B here, there's the baseline or the benchmark um, for whatever the product that's being produced here is, that red line. Emitter B has reduced their emissions or maybe they always fell below it. They don't pay anything. In fact, they're given free credits which they can then sell to emitter A over here if they wish in the carbon market because emitter A is exceeding the benchmark and for those emissions in red only is a carbon price paid. So it's different than a carbon tax where every ton of CO2 equivalent attracts the carbon price. In an output-based allocation system, only those emissions in excess attract a carbon price. And again, for emitters who are below the benchmark, they either pay nothing or are rewarded by being given free emissions credits. In the Alberta system, the other option if you don't buy emissions credits is just to pay a carbon price that goes into a fund. Okay, so that sets the nominal price of carbon, but again, it only attaches to that proportion of your emissions that exceed um, the benchmark. It sets no cap on production. So under the Alberta OBA system, everyone can be in compliance, everyone can be meeting their benchmark obligations, but emissions can be rising because production might be increasing. There is no cap on production. Okay, so the carbon levy applies to any uh, fossil fuels that are combusted when we buy um, gas at the gas station or when we turn on our furnaces, but it doesn't apply to any facilities that are in the OBA system. There, the OBA system applies to all of those emissions, but again, only those ones that are above the benchmark actually pay the price. And a few, some emissions sit outside, but in total, we cover, our systems together cover about 70% of Alberta's total greenhouse gas emissions. About 50% of those though, under the OBA system, are not exposed to the full carbon price. Under the Pan-Canadian framework, both of these systems were fine. When the government changed though, as of 2019, it did a few things. It repealed the carbon levy. And it replaced the carbon competitiveness incentive regulation with what's now called the tier regulation, which moved back to an old system of facility-based benchmarks, but otherwise is roughly the same. And it allowed for the opt-in of smaller and smaller facilities with ha which have much lower emissions into the OBA system. And as the Alberta government's uh, information states, this allows facilities who opt in to be sheltered or protected from the carbon price. So in this way, Alberta's OBA system 
is a way to recognize competitiveness issues on the assumption that all large emitters are trade exposed and that's um, not necessarily um, an assumption that always follows. But it shelters um, or protects from full exposure to the carbon price while still providing economists tell us a price signal that encourages behavior change. And ultimately, we're less concerned with how much any given facility pays in a carbon price uh, than we are with whether they change their behavior to become, in the context of Alberta's system, more energy or emissions efficient, less emissions intensive. Okay, but obviously, oh, and if we were together in, Mer in Murray Fraser Hall, I would ask you to point this out, but uh, I'm sure it's obvious. When we know, now that we know what the benchmark is for the Pan-Canadian carbon price, when we look at Alberta's system with the repeal of the carbon levy, we can see there's a problem. We no longer, this system no longer covers, meets the minimum coverage requirement to cover at least the same emissions that the BC carbon tax does, because it does not cover combustion emissions outside the OBA system. So that's where the backstop steps in. The Greenhouse Gas uh, Pollution Pricing Act steps in. Now what's interesting about this act is that it essentially follows Alberta's hybrid carbon pricing system. The system Alberta had in place uh, prior to the repeal of Alberta's carbon levy. So it's made up of two parts. One is a regulatory charge on the combustion of carbon-based fuels. Just like Alberta's carbon levy was, just like the BC carbon taxes. And the min minimum stringency requirements apply the price specified in the benchmark. Part two of that legislation establishes an output-based allocation system for large industrial emitters. In this case, I think it's emitters over 50,000 tons per annum with opt-in provisions. And just like in Alberta, facilities covered by part two are subject to an activity-specific output-based standard um, that's prescribed by the regulations. And the compliance options are the same. And just like with our Alberta system, only those emissions that exceed the benchmark are actually exposed to them, while the incentive applies across um, the facilities. Okay, so what the federal government does or did is take a look and every province's system to see whether they satisfy, the system satisfies the benchmark. And if not, under the GGPPA, they prescribe part one and or part two to apply, the federal legislation to apply in that jurisdiction. So this is schedule one of that act. And you can see Ontario, New Brunswick, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Yukon, and Nunavut all have the carbon levy, the federal carbon levy under part one of that legislation applying within their jurisdiction. Alberta's 4.1 there because they were added after the fact um, with the repeal of the Alberta carbon levy. Part two though, that OBA system, if you take a look, Ontario, New Brunswick, Manitoba, PEI, Saskatchewan, Yukon, and Nunavut. Alberta's not there because the tier system has been recognized as fulfilling that OBA um, requirement. And so the federal legislation says, hands off there, we'll leave Alberta to sort out its own system. And BC appears nowhere because they satisfy the benchmark and therefore the federal system doesn't apply. I should just note some jurisdictions chose to have the federal system, Yukon, Nunavut, um, for example, 
because they didn't want to go through the, com the complexities of creating their own system. So they use that to their advantage. Okay, just finally, as we want to leave some time for questions then, we now find ourselves in this place where through a change in government, Alberta and Ontario object now to the pan-Canadian uh, approach to carbon pricing that was originally agreed to by these provinces through that framework agreement. Saskatchewan has always objected, they continue to object. So all three of these provinces asked their courts of appeal to consider the constitutional validity of the federal legislation. The Supreme Court of Canada was scheduled to hear this a few months ago, keeps getting pushed back because of COVID. It's currently scheduled to be heard uh, late in September. If you're interested, all of the factums are available um, on the Supreme Court of Canada website. The references from the Saskatchewan and the Ontario Court of Appeals decisions, each of which upheld the validity of the legislation. And they did so on the basis of Section 91 of the Constitution Act and the chapeau provision that introduces the list in our Constitution of what powers the federal government has. And the introduction to Section 91 confers on the federal parliament the power to make peace, order, and good government of Canada in relation, or the, uh, in relation to all matters not coming within the classes of subjects by this act signed exclusively to the legislatures of the parliament. Okay. There's several other potential federal heads of power. And again, I can only wet your whistle for this. You'll talk about this all semester long in constitutional law um, that potentially the federal government could have used. And I would argue they could have used, for example, a very prescriptive criminal law power that imposed possibly a complete prohibition on GHG emissions and relied on their criminal law power. But because of their, the flexible approach that's been adopted here, the GGPPA doesn't fit neatly into any of these other heads of power. So the debate is truly about whether or not the federal parliament has the constitutional power on the basis of peace, order, and good government, POG, um, to uh, pass and sustain you know, the, this federal legislation and impose it on jurisdictions that have chosen not to um, put in place their own systems that meet the federal uh, benchmark. I'll just leave you with this. Um, climate change is, it presents a challenge and we're in a place right now in this world where we understand the challenge that COVID is presenting um, to our economies and to our ways of life. There's many that have argued that the full brunt of climate change um, will be more significant. And so as we think about how this constitutional um, analysis and this constitutional imperative response to this problem, the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal and the majority um, recognized that there is this need to develop the constitution as a living tree, the old living tree analogy that grows and adapts and accommodates um, the modern challenges that we find ourselves faced with. So we shall see um, what the Supreme Court of Canada says about that. Um, but for now, pretending we're back in Murray Fraser Hall, I'd love to hear your questions, your comments, um, any thoughts that you have. Wonderful. So as we wait for some questions to come in, I just have one um, kind of related to your last few points around COVID. Um, so because people are staying at home more and they're driving less, so they're not spewing out carbon from their car, but they're probably using more um, carbon heating their homes or, um, you know, 
powering their laptops and everything. Is the government going to do anything to adapt the carbon pricing as a result of the shift that's been happening in COVID? Um, at this point, there's not a discussion at the federal level about um, any changes. There has been discussions in various provinces, BC in particular. BC is ahead of the federal benchmark. They're currently at $40 a ton. Everyone else is at $20 a ton. So either paying a few cents more at the pump. Um, and they were scheduled on April 1st to, to go to $45 a ton. But for now, those increases have been put on hold in light of COVID. So there is some conversation um, about accommodation there. Cool. Um, yeah, so feel free to type in your questions in the chat box. Here we go. Um, so references are typically only advisory opinions. If the SCC is of the opinion that the price on carbon is unconstitutional, what would happen? Sorry, if I'm uh, sorry, I was mucking around. Share, I'm sharing. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so if the SCC is of the opinion that the price on carbon is unconstitutional, what would happen? Would it be struck down? It would be, um, yes. Um, and then we'll find ourselves in a really interesting position where the federal government, as I say, that's not the only bow um, or arrow it has in its, is it a quiver? Uh, <laughs> and, you know, um, the, the courts of appeal have said this isn't a tax because of the way it's structured and particularly the fact that it returns all the revenues. Um, it's, not the, it's not a criminal, the use of criminal law power because it's not a prohibition. Uh, but maybe the federal government thinks about less flexible mechanisms to ensure that we can move forward with our climate commitments. Um, yeah, so I'll just wait for some questions, more questions to come in if people have them. Sharon, just a question while we're waiting. Um, we're seeing uh, these days places or uh, corporations such as BP that are, are you know, choosing not to um, be in Alberta right now. How important do you think uh, a coherent climate plan and uh, a paying attention to these sort of things will have on, um, you know, the oil and gas industry right now? Do you think that that is playing a part in what we're seeing in major corporations taking a step back? and investors taking a step back? So it's a great question. And I mean, what we're seeing, and as you know, lawyers entering into the practice of law or law students commencing your studies now, it's, it's an amazing time to see how the various tools of law are available to tackle this problem. There's charter references against the governments of Ontario and Canada for not being stringent enough. There's several actions around the world and threats of a similar action commencing in Canada against corporations um, for the damages associated with the emissions that they've been putting into the atmosphere. Um, there is shareholder actions. There's um, breach of fiduciary um, duty um, cases against directors of companies. And so all in all, companies are starting to feel like they must respond to the climate change challenge. And in deciding not to move forward with the largest or the latest oil sands expansion, uh, tech resources said they need to step back and allow Canada to have a comprehensive plan because they need to be able to say to their investors and to their shareholders that they are uh, participating in a positive way towards this transition. So I think the pressure is coming from all different directions um, and I think ultimately it hurts rather than helps to have this incredible uncertainty in Canada. Well it's an interesting time to be studying environmental law and I think Alberta is an incredibly um, interesting place to be doing it because really there is so much going on with respect to uh, environmental policy uh, right here. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess the other thing I didn't mention for any of you who were here um, for Dave's talk last week or a couple weeks ago on the uh, Bill C-69 and the Impact Assessment Act, 
a big coal, um, thermal coal expansion proposal has just been accepted for designation by the federal minister. It's the proposal is just outside of Jasper to move through the Impact Assessment Act and downstream upstream emissions associated with coal are going to be front and center in that um, assessment process too. So yeah, it really is happening right here, right now in this jurisdiction. And I think the Public Interest Law Clinic is working with a client um, around coal mines and they're going to be in a hearing in um, October too. So that's something people can get involved in. Um, it's a pretty meaty subject and I, I'm sure people are still mulling over their questions in their heads. So uh, Sharon, if it's okay, I'm gonna throw out your Twitter handle so people can ask you questions. Um, it, once they think of them a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. All the questions for today. Okay, great. Yeah, happy to chat with anybody. Um, oh, here's one more. Oh, yeah. Um, if the SEC strikes down the price on carbon, would it be binding on the federal government? Um, it, uh, yes, the federal government will not um, attempt to um, uphold the, the validity, the constitutional validity of this legislation if the, if the Supreme Court of Canada says that it doesn't have the power to do so. Thanks again, Sharon, and thank you to everybody who has been here today to learn a little bit about this. Um, that is the end of our mini lecture series for the spring and summer, and I really hope that those of you that participated got something meaningful out of it. Um, we hope that it made you excited to think about the areas of law that you're going to be able to dig into, um, partly in 1L, but more in your, your, your years coming up in 2L and 3L, and just to keep you excited about your future in a really uncertain time. So, you know, we were hoping to engage you that way, to make you excited about your law school career, to know that, uh, that your legal studies don't need to be put on hold because of COVID. It's still gonna be an engaging and interesting world out there to delve into legal issues. Um, for those of you who are admitted students, we have three more information sessions coming up for you prior to your start in September. Um, on Wednesday the 12th, we still have our attire for law students. Um, and please do not take this in any way as us telling you what you must wear to law school. It's just something I get every single year is questions. Some people who are not as, um, you know, uh, familiar with the legal world are worried about those sorts of things. So we have a, one of our alumni, um, Emma May, who actually owns a clothing company but has promised not to, uh, <laughs> to completely plug that, but just to talk a little bit about um, what you might need as a first year law student in terms of a wardrobe, what you need to worry about and not worry about, but please do not take any offense. Um, obviously you can wear whatever you want at the end of the day. It's just trying to provide some guidance for people who, who might have some concerns that way. On uh, Tuesday the 18th, we have our law information session on foundations in law and justice with these two professors who will be teaching you this fall in your um, three week um, law and justice foundations program. And that's Professor Jennifer Koshan and Professor Emily Laidlaw who did a mini lecture for you at the very beginning. She kicked us off on privacy and public shaming issues. Um, and finally on September 1st, just for anybody who's got some nerves, we're just going to have a Facebook Live or, or a Zoom, I guess now, where you can just ask us anything about the start of the year. Sometimes people get nervous over that last Labor Day long weekend. There's just a few questions they wanna to ask to make sure everything's okay. So I'll be here uh, for anybody who has any questions for me so you can all enjoy that last long weekend before you start up for law school. Um, we are really here to help you and make sure that your experience is a good one. So thanks again to everybody, and especially to you, Sharon, for sharing your um, vast knowledge on such an interesting topic today. Um, you'll see some of these students in property law. And uh, I'm just wishing you all well for the rest of the month and stay safe and we'll talk soon. Thanks, Allie, again for moderating. Take care, everyone. Take care.